Welcome to the Industrial Talk Podcast with Scott McKenzie. Scott is a passionate industry professional dedicated to transferring cutting-edge, industry-focused innovations and trends while highlighting the men and women who keep the world moving. So put on your hard hat, grab your work boots, and let's go. All right, welcome to the Industrial Talk Podcast, the number one industrial-related podcast in the universe. I'm not overselling that. I'm telling you that right now. But it is. 100% dedicated to you, the industrial professionals, the companies that get it done. You're bold. You're brave. You dare greatly. You innovate. And you're changing not just the world, but you're changing lives. That's why we celebrate you each and every day on this podcast. It is a platform dedicated to you. Thank you very much for what you do and how you impact our lives in a positive way. Great interview. His name is Dan Bournet. He's a legend in Louisiana, former president of the Louisiana Chemical Association. And man, does he have some chemical street cred. Let's get going. He's a legend. He's also one of the voices of LSU uh, sports. And of course, if you're in Louisiana, LSU is a... A pretty common topic of uh, passion and interest. And uh, Dan, in this interview, it's great because uh, one of the things that uh, we recognize is the impact, the positive impact the chemical manufacturing industry has on our lives. I mean, you look around, you look at everything that uh, you see on this video has something to do and has been touched by the chemical industry powerful industry they just make our lives better now anyway you get the picture dan is an incredible uh, geez, he's just an incredible professional and gentleman no doubt about that now i've been harping on and on this topic and we've been talking about uh companies in you know the number of interviews that i have done and the themes that have been sort of exposed during this particular pandemic have been pretty clear. One, it's always, how do I retain talent? How do I reduce risk? How do I save money? How do I make money, please? How do I make money? And how do I build in right now a sense of resiliency within my business so that if something happens, God forbid, we, we can survive in a better way. So those are sort of the topics and everything that we talk about uh, on the Industrial Talk podcast really sort of revolve around those key topics. Now, we have to consider, once again, the necessity to collaborate, the necessity to innovate as we go forward, because if you're looking for resiliency, you got to innovate. you got to do all of it. If you're looking at making money, you got to, you know, innovate. you got to educate, and that's a big deal. you got to educate because the world is changing rapidly. Education, Dan brings tremendous insight into that. And then, of course, we got to do it with a sense of speed and urgency. you got to be nimble. And then finally, you got to be willing to make mistakes. you got to move forward. You cannot... You cannot be timid in this world, right? And many of the individuals that we have featured on the Industrial Talk podcast are bold, brave, and they dare greatly, and they do it each and every day because they know that we, me, you, depend on them to be successful. And they're going to be the ones that get us through this challenging time. And they bring a lot of energy and positive insights into uh, what's taking place. So nonetheless, it's very, very important Now, Dan, once again, former president of the Louisiana Chemical Association, just starts bringing in this whole history of what's taking place. Now, I'm going to have out on his uh, landing page the, um, the, the videos that he produced in conjunction with LCA, and they're just great. And it just gives you a sense of why this stuff is important, historical perspective of why the chemical industry is so impactful in our lives. And it's, it's great. So once the interview's over, you'll know that we're going to have all of these wonderful links specific to Dan, what he's done, and the impact the chemical uh, industry has in our lives, which has just been a wonderful thing. So without me yammering on and on and on, here's Dan. Enjoy the interview. 
Dan, welcome to the Industrial Talk Podcast. Absolute honor to have you on the number one industrial-related podcast in the universe. Is that a bold statement? I think it's uh, well-deserved. It's delightful uh, to be with you, and I'm honored to be asked. Thank you. Well, for the listeners out there, this is, this is an honor. You've, you're you're going you're gonna to be amazed by uh, Dan's absolute street cred when it comes to uh, the chemical industry, broadcasting, you name it. Dan is a legend. Yeah, you are. In Louisiana, the state of, in the Gulf South. So, Dan, give us a little 411 on your background for the listeners out there. Thank you uh, so much, Scott. Well, early in my career, uh, after having graduated from Nickel State, uh, I had uh, stints in broadcasting uh, in government, worked for uh, two or three U.S. senators and a governor, uh, had, uh, had a stint in education, and then went to work for uh, Kaiser Aluminum and Chemical Corporation, right. multinational. I worked with Kaiser for 10 years in plants up and down the river here in Louisiana. And then for nearly 30 years, I worked with the Louisiana Chemical Association. I retired from the LCA at the end of 2016 and gave the baton to my colleague of many years, Greg Bowser, who now runs the LCA and all of its related organizations. And so what I've had the opportunity to do over those years is to see the industry grow, contract, and then grow exponentially over the last several years. It's been a very exciting renaissance from the time in the early 2000s when the price of natural gas was uh, astronomical and threatened the very existence of our industry. And then to have this uh, incredible shift, this incredible turnaround where uh, fracking came into being and natural gas became abundant and cheap. And that changed the entire landscape. It changed the game. And from that point on, the amount of investment that has come to Louisiana and to Texas and to the Gulf South has been unbelievable. Billions and billions of dollars of investment in the ground now and billions more uh, in the planning stages, which I think will come, may come a little later because of what we are uh, going through now with the pandemic. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, it, it's, it's, it's going to happen. So my long-term oh, yeah. outlook for petrochemical manufacturing in Louisiana and in Texas is very bullish. You know, it's interesting when we start talking about the value, and when I say it's 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 a um, it's a locational value as well, not just the fact that we get the feedstock, the chemical, the energy, the ability to be able to pull mm -hmm. in that natural mm -hmm. gas. It's also the logistics and our access to water and then beyond. And so that's what makes that whole Gulf South, Louisiana, Texas, so mm -hmm. um, important, not just from here, but globally. And the ability to be able to manufacture uh, these important chemicals to make our lives better. Well, yes, you know, nature didn't give us uh, the white beaches that uh, no. that Florida got. Didn't give us the mountains of Colorado. Uh, nature gave us uh, dead dinosaurs. Uh, gave us a Jurassic Park of raw materials, oil, natural gas. Yeah. Uh, gave us the aorta of American commerce, the Mississippi River. Uh, gave us these natural gifts, and with those natural gifts, uh, we developed a tremendously uh, supportive infrastructure, and uh, we had uh, we we developed an incredibly productive workforce, and so we've taken those gifts of nature, uh, we've molded them into uh, an infrastructure that can move product around from plant to plant, can get product to market through pipelines and barges and ships and and rail, and uh, with an extremely productive and very, very uh, safety-conscious workforce. And, and it's uh, cost-effective. You're, de you're dealing with what you said, and I think that it's real important, that uh, the, chemical, the, the, the chemical portfolio that exists where, in this goal, we're able to so also transact between business to business, natural gas, and whatever right. other chemicals right. that I can consume or I need for my feedstock, for my product. It's all right here, and it's very um, efficient in that sense, too. And I like the well, way you, you talk about it. It's a symbiotic relationship uh, between and among the oil and gas industry and the chemical industry. That's why we call it the petrochemical industry. Natural gas is to a chemical plant like what flour is to a, a bakery shop. 
you know, a baker uses flour to make virtually everything in that baker shop. You go to Ambrosia, you go to any of the great bakeries down in New Orleans and in the North Shore, and you're going to find lots of stuff made out of flour. That's the same thing that natural gas is to chemical plants. And so we use it to generate electricity. Uh, we use it for heat. We use it also as a basic raw material. We strip things from natural gas. We make other things out of it. And so our primary use of natural gas is to crack ethane. And from that cracking uh, process, we get an entire range of chemicals that we eventually turn into finished products down the road. Much of the rest of the world doesn't use natural gas for its chemical production. It uses naphtha. It crackles. It cracks a barrel of oil to get naphtha so that it can get its, its uh, chemical uh, uh, derivatives. And so when the price of oil is in a certain relationship to the price of natural gas, the Louisiana petrochemical industry and the Texas petrochemical industry, and now even the American petrochemical industry, can really knock the socks off of most of the rest of the world when it comes to chemical manufacturing. I'll give you a ratio. Wow. The oil is bumping up now. Oil is about $40 a barrel as we speak today. It could be different when people listen to this podcast. Natural <laughs> gas is about 2 bucks an MMBTU. Uh, you know, you divide uh, 2 and, uh, into 40, and you get a 20 to 1 ratio. Uh, 20 to 1 ratio. Any ratio that's 7 and a half or 8 to 1 greater it is, it is, it is, it is just hands down. Natural gas is going to win that competitive, uh, that competitive manufacturing uh, process. And so, when 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 oil is up and, and and gas is in the proper ratio, then the America can beat the world when it comes to chemical production. And that's why you've got a six to seven billion dollar cracker uh, going up in Western Pennsylvania. Yeah. Shell is building that uh, that cracker up there on uh, on top of of a fracked gas, uh, and, and that would have never happened had we not had this revolution in natural gas, which has developed now into a renaissance for American chemical manufacturing. So this is interesting because when you take that ratio, the barrel of oil, and and we've we because of uh, Corona, we've had some real volatility within that barrel of oil. We've got over you know, abundance of uh, inventory around the world. and But now that it's trending a little north, $40, $50, $60, <clears throat> natural gas, does natural gas follow that sort of trend or does it? Not, no, not necessarily. No, it does not. It, 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 it's independent of that. Gas could be uh, at, uh, at, at three bucks in MNBTU and oil could be at a hundred. There's really no de direct correlation there. Uh, the key correlation is between naphtha and ethane. Yeah. And when you are cracking oil versus natural gas, yeah. natural gas will win any time your ratio yeah. is seven uh, to one or greater. So, And in the United States, what does it look like from a natural gas outside of the, the because of fracking, because the technology with fracking and because of uh, the success? Uh, what's the inventory with that natural gas? It's, it's, it's a lot, right? In North America. It, it, it's huge. It, it's, it's incredibly huge. In fact, I'll give you a, a, a comparative statistic. Uh, in 2008, 2009, when natural gas was uh, 12, 14 bucks an MMBTU, yeah. there were about 50, and I counted them. I've got them on the map. There were about 50 planned LNG import terminals. Now, not all of those import terminals were going to get built, but companies were looking to bring natural gas into the United States because they thought we were running out of natural gas. Uh, well, when fracking came along, the economic model got turned on its head. And now instead of import facilities for LNG, we've got export facilities for LNG. America's got so much gas, we're building LNG export terminals to ship it to the world, to Japan and to China. And it's still and, and, and probably that's priced how much, That's right. how much gas we have. And it, it is yeah, still, well, you know, you, it can land yeah. it. The price point will still be there, and it benefits, it benefits more. I mean, you're just you're bringing it in because the price point is right. Hmm. Yeah, and of course, you know, not every LNG terminal that is uh, planned is going to get built either. It's just like when we were looking at 50 import terminals and 
just a couple got built. Uh, and, and on those, they flipped the switches on them. They've turned them from import terminals to expert, export yeah. terminals. And it's an expensive uh, sp- uh, switch to flip because those things are billion dollars, uh, you know, a lick, uh, more than that. And so it's a very expensive. But that, yes, that is happening. Uh, America is full of, 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 of natural gas. See, that's and, – and once again, in the Gulf South, they've got to go someplace, and it just makes complete sense coming on down to the Gulf South for export solution. Now, listeners out there, if you've never seen an LNG terminal, it's something to behold. They are absolutely massive, and, and I, I remember the first time I saw one, it, it, it blew my socks off. I couldn't – you just yeah. – you couldn't stop staring at it because it was so massive. Now – I got to I got to sort of go off on a tangent. Why is the Calcasieu uh, Parish so sort of? Th- that's where a lot of the LNGs are. Why? Yeah. Well, what they've makes got that uh, they've got very the 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 Calcasieu Basin has very easy access to the Gulf of Mexico. It's right there on the Gulf of Mexico, and uh, you don't have to go very far from uh, Cameron Parish to get right into the Gulf. In fact, it borders the Gulf. And so it's a perfect place for these export terminals. You know, all of the uh, investment numbers that we've been talking about over the years for petrochemical investment, none of those numbers uh, in, in include LNG terminals. LNG terminals get a different investment line. When we say that $60 billion of, uh, of investment has been earmarked for Louisiana and about $40 billion of that is in the ground already, that, that's petrochemical investment, not necessarily uh, LNG investment. And so you not only have uh, huge investments in chemical manufacturing, you also have a separate line, of very huge investments in LNG terminals. Yeah. And, and they're, they're, they're big capital. That's that once again, yeah. it's big capital. We're not talking little, little tiny numbers by any stretch of the imagination. Now with that said, uh, Dan, you've seen it from when, when the industry as a whole was struggling, natural gas now all of a sudden, just the lifeblood of uh, chemical manufacturing, petrochemical manufacturing, all, any, everything associated with it. Where do you see it trending? Where do you see it going? I know you're bullish. What mm-hmm. do you see? Mm-hmm. Well, I'm bullish because uh, the world is going to eventually uh, return to some degree of normalcy. And if you look at the um, production run rates, if you look at inventories, if you put those things for the long term, you're going to find that sometime in uh, 2021, uh, the uptick is going to begin. It's going to look somewhat like a, like a hockey stick, okay? Uh-huh. And then I think by 2022, by 2022, we're really going to be up and running again. It's going to take some time to adjust uh, to a diminished worldwide demand yeah. because of the pandemic. Uh, but that's going to come back eventually. And you, you, you have to look at this uh, not in the short term, but you have to look and take your, 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 your long-term lenses on to look how this is going to eventually evolve into the future. And, and I think it's very positive and very optimistic for American manufacturing. And if it's good for American manufacturing, it's doubly good for Louisiana because so much of that yeah. manufacturing is based right here in South Louisiana. Yeah, and and given the fact that I see what you're saying, a couple of years, back up full, does it, but we're still going to be consuming the necessity to consume the chemicals that are being manufactured in this area. That's one, two. Two, uh, I, don't see, I don't see natural gas uh, getting a spike. It might, there might be price fluctuations, but you're not going to see it because of, because of the abundance of natural gas and the necessity uh, or the ability to be able to export. That's always a good thing. We got abundance, let's export it. So, so that stability of that feedstock and our ability to be able to use that is, is great. And that's, that's, that's going forward. You don't see it. Not like the volatility in the, um, the oil market where it could be all over the place. Yeah. And there are other countries getting into, uh, getting into exporting LNG as well. So we're, we're, we've got competition all over the world when it comes to exporting LNG. You know, just for the listeners who may not automatically know how it works, what you take, you take natural gas, just like you burn in your stove, uh, you know, and you freeze it. 
you freeze it uh, so much that it becomes a liquid. You put that liquid into ships and you send those ships all over the world. And then when those ships get to where they're going, uh, you heat it up again and it becomes gas again. That is the process. It's a pretty simple process when you think yeah. about it. But it's multi-billion dollars a copy to build an LNG plant to get the LNG tankers that you need to ship the stuff and then to have uh, the facilities on the other end to take it and to reconvert it or to convert it back into a gas. And, and, and it's on a grand scale. I just, it's, yeah, well, it's big it, stuff. It, it's, it's big. Yeah. I love if it. you want to hunt with those guys, you're going to have to hunt with the big dogs. <laughs> big I can tell you. That's, I was out there. That's, that's serious, serious money. It is. And I, it, yeah. my first, when I was telling you, my first exposure to an LNG, and I can't remember where it was, but I was doing some um, fishing, redfish. We were in some sort of part of, you know, uh, West, um, West Louisiana. And we're out there poodling around, mm-hmm. tootling, tootling. And then we come up, and all I could remember are these tanks. Not, not just not just what I, I'm used to, like, you know, bulk liquid. No, these are yeah. massive. And it's just, and the ability to be able to manage that safely, manage that commodity within that tank is a, is a remarkable achievement. Well, not only that, but to try and ship it uh, thousands and thousands of miles to Japan or to China or to wherever it's going in a, yeah. safe, in a safe manner, yeah. Yeah, I, I love it. Uh, Dan, we're going to have to wrap it up. I mean, we're, we're running out of time right now, but how would somebody get a hold of you? What would, what's the best way for a listener to say, doggone it, I like what Dan was saying. I, I would like to talk to him. Uh, well, I tell you, I, the, my, my colleagues at the Chemical Association uh, have been so kind to me and have permitted me to keep my uh, email address, and it's very <laughs> simple. It's dan at lca.org. That's dan at lca.org. It, it really doesn't, it doesn't get any easier than that. I'm telling you right now, I've seen a lot of domain names and boy, they're pretty rough. LCA, I can remember. I can remember how to spell Dan and I definitely can put an ORG on the end of that. I'm successful. You too, listeners can be successful. Dan, I know I appreciate your time, your wisdom, your insights into just the, sort of that macro look at what's taking place. Oh, one last question. Mm-hmm. Now, do you see from a jobs perspective for, you know, people, do you see a, a, a bright opportunity for people who are just seeking employment? Absolutely. In fact, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, uh, my, uh, my colleague Greg Bowser and I and, and Lisa Pulizano, who runs the Chemical Association Alliance, we spent uh, a morning visiting the Baton Rouge Community College last week to look at that process technology program, which is very vibrant. And, and, and extremely important to the industry. Uh, there are process technology programs now at several community colleges around the state where young people are coming out of high school, uh, going to a community college for two years, and then going to work for a chemical plant or a refinery and making eighty to $90,000 a year with a technical degree. And as the workforce ages, as the workforce ages, uh, then uh, they likewise uh, create jobs for people uh, who are coming out of the community colleges with these uh, outstanding degrees in process technology. See, it, it, it come on, it, it's got to blow your mind that they're coming out eighty to ninety grand, seventy. Grand, it doesn't really matter. Coming out, doing something that this is is this important, and that is just the beginning. It, it's it's. It's even better going up as you continue to become greater and, and better at what you do. I, I'm just, it's exciting. Yeah, Scott, and it's Scott these, are, these are not your grandfather's plant jobs. No. These are uh-huh. jobs, uh, these young men and women get into control rooms uh, with, with uh, Honeywell system screens up there. And with a joystick and a mouse, <clears throat> they're controlling a billion dollars worth of investment uh, with two years of technical training at a community college. Uh, and no debt at all to worry about. And so it's a tremendous opportunity for our young people. And the idea is to get it, get that out with, uh, you know, folks like yourselves who are, who, who've got a lot of people listening and who can help us uh, explain to young people their opportunities in our industry. Very good. All right, Dan, thank you very much. Thank you for joining the Industrial you, Talk Scott. Podcast. Absolute honor. You listeners out there, you know, stay tight. 
We're going to wrap it up on the other side. Thank you for listening to the Industrial Talk Podcast. We will be right back. You're listening to the Industrial Talk Podcast Network. All right. Thank you again, once again for joining the Industrial Talk Podcast. Dan Bournet is his name. Incredible gentleman, incredible professional, passionate about the chemical industry and the benefits that it brings to our lives each and every day. We celebrate you, the chemical professionals, everybody that is associated with that. Thank you very much for making our lives better. Once again, you'll get everything that you need to know about uh, Mr. Dan out on his podcast on industrialtalk.com. And I highly recommend that you look at the videos that he has provided, the links about the history of the chemical industry, specifically here in the Gulf South, and uh, all the wonderful things that people do to make our lives better. It's, it's, a, it's a great conversation. Again, go out to the Industrial Talk podcast. We're really kicking in gear the Industrial Academy. And the reason we're doing that is twofold. One, you got to educate. Two, you got to educate. And I'll throw another one in there. You got to educate, especially now. And we're going to be highlighting the best of the best within industry, teaching and, and departing the education that we need to be successful in the future. So that's at industrialtalk.com. And it is the Industrial Academy. You'll find it easily out there. Be bold, be brave, dare greatly. Change the world. That's what we're all about. Thank you very much. And we'll be back with another incredible interview shortly.